without an introduction, I think it's, it's the best way to go. What I'll, what I'll do is just show my show reel uh, and then uh, take about a half an hour break and we can talk about whatever you want, any questions that you want. Uh, some of the spots that are on the show reel are from school, some are not from school. I think the stronger ones are from school, no agency involvement. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I think there's some stuff in there that uh, I think works, some stuff that doesn't work. I want, of course, that's very subjective on what everybody thinks works. There's, some, there's one piece that everybody's offended by and uh, hasn't been on the reel for a while, but I'd like to show it just because I'd like to show on why it fails, why it doesn't say what I wanted it to say and the reason why it's not on the reel. So I'll show that piece. You can boo and hiss all you want. And uh, all the pieces are, so some of them, are, they are director's cuts, so they would have different music than sometimes what went on the air. About 80% of them have the same music, but they are, by definition, the exact length that was required, which is the only thing that I hold uh, like the Bible. When, when you do a cut for the agency, I think it's kind of bizarre when director's cuts are four minutes long and suddenly the piece really works and the agency's got a 30 second cut that airs and looks like crap. <laughs> so <laughs> you, I think w w what you'll see is, except for one exception, you'll see all of them are the exact length required. The subjective differences that I've made are on a few cuts and changes and on music that's different. So it's about, I think, 15, 15 16 minutes long. So I'll, I'll go through that. Right, okay, I'll go through that and then I'll just, just sit up here and talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's actually the reel as it goes out, minus the sheep spot. <laughs> so I'll, I'll start from the beginning and just talk a little bit off the piece. I won't talk about what I think the pieces are about, because if they fail there, then they don't work. Uh, the couple of spots in the beginning, actually, I think um, most me, uh, because I think a lot of them were done in school. The A&E one, which is, of course, a spec spot, the one that with the African pieces, uh, how that came about was uh, we had two classes in school, one of the documentary class and one of the fashion class, and I was trying to combine the assignments so I wouldn't have to do two assignments. <laughs> and, 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 and when uh, the documentary teacher had asked to make a documentary, any subject that we wanted, and I asked him that I couldn't really afford to make a documentary, but I'd like to make uh, an ad for a documentary that I think should be made and uh, basically it was, uh, uh, what I always liked was you know, more interesting pen love as I do him. Uh, what I liked more was just a photograph of his in the middle of a desert where he was pulling people out of the blue and actually cleaning them up and then taking their photos. Of the amount, basically the amount of manipulation involved in making something look real. And I just thought, just to go behind that and something that had the feel of that, that would be it. And of course, pen is you know, as, 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 as fashion as you can get. So I pitched the, uh, the, the, the project to both classes and the, uh, the fashion teacher and the other one agreed. And that's how I think that one came along. Uh, the next, the, uh, the Levi's one, the campfire, and the Smirnoff, and then the next Levi's again, I think the other spots that I have there, but have, where I've had maximum input from agencies, uh, to an agency. Uh, the campfire one, originally if it came, as David will tell you, uh, when the script came out, it was uh, kind of supposed to be a bunch of cowboys sitting around a campfire, and uh, you know, warming themselves up, and somebody's playing a guitar, and basically his nuts catch on fire. I mean, he, he gets hot, and that was supposed to be the idea, and what they wanted to do was show that uh, that uh, th the classic genes they, you know, th needed some improving, and they did it. But now they're going to reintroduce some of them because not too many people sit near campfires again. So that was the idea. And when it came in, I, I was fighting throughout because I thought it, it kind of was two blazing saddles. All you needed was a bunch of cowboys farting, and you'd be there. And I just <laughs> thought uh, what we needed to do was you know, br bring it in such a way so I could give this guy license to sit down next to the fire. And you know, that's then I think my, my ex-girlfriend came up with all the ideas about basically making it a photographer who goes around the place. And in about 10 minutes, she wrote the whole idea up and when I pinched it to Levi's and they said yes, there was an improvement and they went for it. Uh, generally, as the comments, uh, you'll find that almost all of these spots I've had, uh, the ones that I have here, I have had um, the best spots are ones that I've gotten just one line from an agency. And on that one line, they've let me do whatever I want. And uh, uh, Smirnoff is the, is the classic example. They involved me a lot earlier. And their whole idea was supposed to be, um, when, they, when they wrote it and sent me, was uh, basically a very 90s, now hip party in Los Angeles, where there's a waiter taking a bottle and going through the party. And all of it is supposed to be one shot, basically, uh, like that. And as you walk across, you would see that, you know, like you see people change as you go through it. And all of it's supposed to be just one shot, going like, uh, so I came in and talked to them. And 
my take on it was that I really liked, and I was very surprised that they had sold such an idea to a client about an alternate universe in a vodka bottle, but uh, they had. And I said, I, I really like that, and uh, what I'd like to do it is actually change their setting. And I thought the whole thing was too gimmicky. It looked like one shot, and it just would be more about how to, how to execute it. It was all that bothered, seemed to bother everybody, uh, bothered everybody. And I think the, the classic example is, is my DP keeps saying, Paul Laffey always says, you know, if, if you had executed like that, it would be a classic case of you know, the, the operation was successful, but the patient died. So I went and told them that, and they said, well, what would you like to do? And I just said, just keep that idea, and I'll come up with everything else. And they said, fine. In stepped my girlfriend again. And she wrote this, I think, script in about 10 minutes. And she said, you know, like, how about making it a, you know, like something classic like a boat? And then we wrote all the transitions down, and I walked into the agency. This, this, this took about a month. And I went in there, and I think the creators really, really had balls because it was the kind of thing where, where they would say that, okay, we know that is supposed to be the base idea. The rest of the stuff that's been sold to the client, we can go and back off it. And they went to the client and said they'd sold him something that they felt that you know, could be much better. And the client was great. They said, fine. And we ended up at the spot that we did. The next one, Levi Swimmer, against one line, which was brilliant. It just said, man swims from pool to pool. The end line is, the more you wash them, the better they get. That was it. And I said, great, come up with five pools in the pool, what happens in each pool, wrote it up, and made a little book. And uh, the book is sitting out here because that's the first commercial I did out of school for, for Europe. And I have it over here, and everybody's always surprised on how lucky I got in getting that spot. And I think if you take a look at that book, you'd know that I think the, the whole gang of people of us who worked together really had it together when we went for it. Because I was ready to go back to sco school and do some more spots or go to Europe and do change my reel, basically. And that was a perfect in. And that's how that one came along. From that one goes to the American commercial, which is the, 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 the dog one, which is the ant line commercials. I mean, there's kind of an example of a spot that I really, really liked to a certain extent, very hard, worked very hard to improve, but I still don't think what happened on the air was what it needed to be. Uh, there, Ripomatic, which was sent to me, was a dog basically sitting like this with all the lines you know, written on top of him, which said, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, in a former life, she was wearing blah, blah, blah on top of it. And I just said, that was kind of too intrusive because if you looked at the dog's face, I said, no, you should look at the eyes and say, you know, there's a woman in there somewhere. And if you write the script on top of it, you know, you can't do it. So I talked to them about it and we came up with the line and all the script was on the side and the dog was on one side. Then I tried explaining to them on why the words needed to play because I thought it was brilliantly written. It needed to be life in her former blah, blah, blah. And they couldn't, they couldn't really have the time to tell me that they liked it or no. They just kind of said, yes, 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 uh, we think we know what you're talking about. And of course, out here, you can't really get the piece of film from them unless they've edited it and it's on the air. So I waited for six months until I got the film from them and I showed it to them and the writer called me up and said, I wish we'd understood what you were talking about. I said, me too. So it's kind of like that because their version of it, all the words came up together and a person just read the whole thing. He just said, in a formal life, and he was wearing, duh, 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 and the whole thing went right through. It was strong, but I think it would have been much stronger. And the, I, I tried to tell them, couldn't it be more different? And they said, the guy had a Bostonian accent, which apparently is very different. And I said, ah, oh, well, all white guys sound the same to me, so I didn't really like that one. <laughs> so I let it go. So, from there, on to the, uh, the, the sheep spot, how that happened. Uh, my girlfriend found a book which was uh, called A Tragedy in Fairs, and it was a brilliant photograph of uh, basically halal, which is something that I just grew up with when we were there, which is, you know, you're going to eat something, they kill it in your backyard, you go and you eat it. And I saw this contact, uh, uh, what, what the, the person had done in the photograph was not just one photo of the sheep bleeding, what he had done is printed all the contact print, and it was just, it was brilliant on what was happening in it, which was that the sheep in the middle, when the throat had been cut, was kicking, and it's top being heavier, had kicked itself around in a circle, and the blood had made you know, a circle, which I thought hmm, looked great. And that was about it. I just got the book. It, it, it was kind of like, you know, the sheep's in the like here, and it cuts the line by two little teeny, teeny, teeny points, and made a brilliant circle. So I showed that to the people in the office. I came and said, isn't this great? And everybody went, oh, fuck, that's disgusting. That's terrible, blah, 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 blah. And I thought, oh my god, I'm in the middle of vegetarians. I shouldn't say anything, so I kept quiet. And we went out for lunch, and needless to say, nobody blinked, ordered lamb, ordered this, ordered that, and I just said, okay, this Saturday, I'm gonna get on a plane, I'm gonna go to fairs, and I'm gonna film that and bring it back to you, because you, know, you shouldn't. Basically, I just, it just pissed me off. I just, 
If you can't see it die, you can't eat it. I'm not saying don't eat it, but you've got to, everybody of course knows that it doesn't really grow in the supermarket and blah, 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 but you've, you've, you've got to you know, like see it to do that. So I went out there, shot it, and I came back, and then of course I didn't know what to do with a piece of film. Sat, sat on it for a while, and then somebody from MTV Asia said that you'd done a spot for MTV there, can you do one for us? Well, I said, I've got one for you, I don't think you want it. And they said, well, send it to us. So I sent it to him, never heard from him again. But <laughs> I've, I took the spot, and I put it on my reel, because the, the only reason I think that it's not there, no apologies for it, but I think it doesn't say what I wanted to say. I think people's reaction, the way it comes off on it, is more like that, that, that famous spot where the, where the fashion models are wearing mink and they're just you know, throwing blood. It's kind of like sledgehamming the mink on the head for nothing at all. That's how people feel about it. That's why I think it fails. All I wanted to say was, uh, if you can't see it die, don't eat it. And basically it doesn't say that. That's why I think it fails. So it's not there. Moving on to the Anne Klein again, the sex one. Yeah, again, on th on the, the, the sex one, I actually, I like a lot, which is the woman writing the man, because there was a very, very tough problem. They wanted to show as much as you can before the censors give you a problem. And uh, I think uh, there's, there's um, in Sacrifice, Tarkovsky's film, there's a brilliant scene in which there's a kid sleeping on a bed, and there's a window on the side, and as the wind blows, the window basically flows in and the source becomes bigger and the exposure is so dangerous that in the beginning you can only see the window but when the wind blows in the exposure comes up and you see oh my god there's a baby in the bed and the window goes out and the exposure becomes smaller and you can't really see too much so I thought how about designing a really complicated shot in which the exposure shows you and senses basically what you don't want to see so you put this woman on the bed she's on the guy so when she starts to take off her bra which is when the sensors will shout you blow the curtain out and the exposure comes down, and then you know, like she sits up again, the exposure comes up, so I choreographed this, says, yes, yes, yes. And of course, we can cover it in the other way, right? The conventional way. And, and when we went over there, of course, I got 10 minutes to do my version, and then the whole day we were trying to figure out how to show a tit and not show a tit. So we just, <laughs> all the time, we kept working on that. But I did like that. In the end, they liked it a lot and, and, and ran it. And that, uh, after that, the spot, the boxer shots, that's, of course, from school. Uh, again, the kind of thing you can only do in school, which is, you know, we didn't have a product. We just had these three, four cool girls, and we were thinking, have an older man with a sugar daddy relationship with no product. And we ended up in this warehouse, and we said, what do we shoot? And of course, the old man didn't turn up. But his clothes looked much better on the women. So they started wearing them out, and I said, if we can think of a product that, they, you know, is not so obvious, and somebody said, boxer shots, and I said, what's that? And they explained it to me, and I said, Psh, perfect. So they got the boxer <laughs> shot, and... And in, in, in we had about three hours in there, we had no permission. We had three hours, and in three hours we just shot it, and I came back, and again, I tried to, that was my first experience with advertising people in the film school, and I mean in the school where I asked them, could you write something for me? Yes, yes, we'll see you tomorrow. Yes, yes, we'll see you tomorrow. And then finally, online came, and I had to run in there. And so I think it's kind of written, it now sounds charming to me, but that time when I saw it, I just thought it was very badly written. It was written by me, that's why. But that was it. In the Lee jeans, one of the best experiences I had here in America with the uh, Fan Miguel again. I think the creatives were brilliant. They had one line which said, uh, no, look like a model, don't think like one. And I just said, what you've got to do is cast the right guy, and that's it. And this guy is not like that. He was a lovely guy. He was really, really good. But when he put on that attitude, the crew wanted to cut his throat. <laughs> he just went at it and would not stop. He was brilliant. <laughs> That one, and then the Mars supermodels is what it is. The Levi is the Cinderella one. Of course, something confusing in there also. There's, there's, there's a shot that's missing in there, which is the literal her Brits lift, which was the guy turning around with the tires. That was the one that they ended up with on the air. Uh, it looks pretty close still, and I'll tell you how something like that actually came as such a direct lift. I thought, well, a little bit of a background. When I did the first Levi's, I had to go and tell them that I really liked the swimmer one. I liked the music, which was Diana Washington. And I told them, I'd really like this piece of music on it. They said, yes, yes, but it's too depressing. And I kept saying, no, no, no the, the images are so kitsch. You know, it'll be so contrapuntal, it'll work. And finally, you know, they said, okay, okay, we'll try it. In the end, when I showed them the cut, I mean, what I did was I kind of cheated on them. I went and cut the piece of music down to a minute and a half, down to a minute. And I choreographed it that you know, when he jumps into the pool, the strings come up, he comes out, this comes. So he completely cut it like a music video. So I showed it to them, and they said, ah, oh, lovely, we love it, now let's change the music. And they tried everything, but nothing else would fit in. So 
they tried my cut on the air and people loved it and it worked fine. And of course, somewhere down the lane, I got a call from somebody, I don't even know if they're from the agency, saying, did you know that song was written by a boy for another boy? And I went, oh, really? Yeah, it's called Porter, isn't it? Yes, yes. And it was that kind of confusion, paranoia, that I just thought, like, you know, like I've got to have my music from before. That piece of music on the next one, which is the Cinderella one, it didn't, it's not the one that went on the air. I think they chose another rock track, which I think was kind of garbagey. But uh, in that spot, initially what it was supposed to be was when she finds the guy, eventually, he's a red Indian. He's got hair down to, I mean like, when they told me he can be a red Indian, I said that's brilliant because they've always had white, tight, and out of sight guys. And I just thought if he's you know, red Indian, that would be nice. And I told them red Indian doesn't mean just crooked nose, I want long hair, blah, blah. And they said yes. So I designed this shot, which is you know, from a Curtis uh, photo, which he's got a shield in one hand and a hammer in the other, a red Indian, and I wanted, wanted to do, put a tire and some sort of wrench in the other, which would kind of be different from the herb shot. But one week before the shoot, everybody flew in really paranoid saying the client from X country will not take a red Indian as a hero. He has to be white, tight, and out of sight. And then suddenly I'm thrown with this guy and I don't have a shot for him. And I just thought, hmm, here's a way. I thought the most gay image known to anybody was the Herbert's guy lifting up the tires. <laughs> I said, that would be a kind of an in joke. She finds the guy and he's gay. But... <laughs> <laughs> It, it didn't work, unfortunately, because <laughs> when I put it in, it wasn't as well known as I thought it was, and people who recognized it thought of it as something else, like they'd see it and they'd say, you know, that's Herbert Short. I'd say, yes, I know, I know. I mean, like, it's just supposed to be one head, but apparently it wasn't that well known, so I, I took it off. Well, then there's the tattoo spot, which is in itself what it is. And the last one is the MTV spot, which I did the Duché piece. The idea for that I'd written in class uh, about five years ago and pitched it to my teacher but didn't have the money to make. It came from, um, we had a Godard class and in that there was I think a quote from Godard where he was talking about uh, you know, splitting conservatives and liberals and how he was saying it was, you know, con uh, that there's two types of people, people who first take a piss and then wash their hands, or people who first wash their hands and then take a piss, you know, the conservative being the guy, you know, once he's taken a piss, thinks he's touched something dirty, he'll wash his hands, and the liberal being the guy who thinks, you know, his penis is cleaner than anything else he could have touched. So I just thought <laughs> that idea would be, uh, would be nice to make if a guy walks into a loo, takes a pee, washes his hands, comes back, washes and I just thought the whole coat should come out from some sort of a dictator. Didn't really want to you know, get some stock pictures of Godard, so I just thought, first I thought Hitler, I don't know why, and then it came out, I just thought, you know, Duché, the line just would be great to have somebody like Mu Mussolini say, and of course, him doing that thing, was when I saw that footage, I said, you know, that's it. So I went back to school, because again, MTV has no money, went back to school and all of us got together, and we shot it. And that's, that's that till there. So I'll start on the questions on whatever you want. Thank you. What was the whoop? <laughs> what was the music on the Bor Borghese spot? The Bulgarian choir. Sorry. The Bulgarian choir. That didn't run on the air like that either. It's the Bulgarian choir. I think they did a new album which was called Guns and Roses. Those women did, and it was quite amazing. Uh, the Mysteries of the Bulgarian Choir, that's the complete name. Yeah. If your girlfriend had so many good ideas, how come she's your ex now? <laughs> oh no. Good question. Good question. I have made a career out of ripping off her work, <laughs> okay? For the last four years, anybody who's worked with me would say that. And I've been trying to get her to direct, and it has not worked, and it's not something that we can, and it's just become more and more intangible. And now what I'm trying to do, especially, I want to work more in America, and there isn't really too much work that I like here, or even in Europe, for that matter. And what I'm going to do is take a break, and she's going to direct, and I'm going to art direct for her. So she's starting that now and I'm working her with her on her ideas. We still live together. You say you'd like to work more in the States. Uh, 
exactly what do you think you could work on here? I mean, my God, you know, you see what most of the advertising here is like. Um, how optimistic are you that you'll oh, be able to find well, something? I've actually do? just done a spot that's for states, and I'd like I'll show it to you after this. I think my my biggest handicap here has been in, in two folds. One is always the time pressure, which is like here's an idea that has been sold down the line to the client. Everything. Can you shoot this board? And I always keep saying, I can't shoot a board. I make my boards. Can you just leave it as the crux of the idea? Usually hasn't worked, but I'm trying to play the game a bit and be a bit more flexible. My biggest handicap here is the 30-second format. I don't really think I get to say too much, and most of the ideas that I get are much bigger than they need to be said in 30 seconds, and I don't particularly like too much cutty stuff. So I kind of have a bit of a handicap there, but I'm willing to learn. Do you think you'd be working for Widen again? For Widen? Oh, I love that agency. I mean, like, I have problems with them. They're only the best, though. So <laughs> I don't know what to do. I think, I'd, I'd, of course, I'd love to work with them. Excuse me. At uh, what point in your career did you shoot the uh, REM video, and how important was it exposure-wise for you, being that it was so popular? V uh, very much. It was, I think, the spot that got I me mean, the Levi Swimmer. I like to think that. Uh, because that was the first spot, though, that I directed out of school, the REM video was the first music video that I did. Until then, I think my work was very strong. And then I did the RM video. And it, it just changed. I mean, like before that, all I kept doing was, you know, student experimenting stuff. And that video got me a lot of exposure. And I got, got the kind of scripts that I think I wanted to do. But again, they were locked into certain things. And when I tried working here in America, I think I fumbled really badly twice. And I thought the only way I would make it is either go back to school and do more spots or use Europe as school and just go there and basically do more spots for, I gave myself two years, it's been two and a half, and I think I've put together a good reel. I want to give America a shot. A couple of months ago, there was an article in uh, Variety uh, on you. Uh, you talked about uh, your dislike of a very common formula in American advertising, which is that barrage of chaotic visuals that your perception was you would rather uh, take a still and bring it to life. Um, can, can you talk about what it is that bothers you about that formula advertising? And also, do, do, doesn't it seem a little risky to you to make a statement of that sort in print? Uh, the latter part of the question I didn't get. Something about print, what is that? Yes, I just wondered, you know, it, it could be considered impolitic to make that sort of a statement in print. And I wondered if you were, if maybe somehow... If it, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, the cinema verite, yes, that, that was it. I think, I think my main problem with it is it's too easy. And I think when I first came and started watching television, must have been like, I mean, I came to America, which was like 1984. Right about 85, 86, it became the thing, which was, you know, I, I, it always surprised me how advertising took so long to actually get to something like that. You know, this is the 60s thing of being out of control, and if you're trying to show impromptu stuff, that's something that should have been obvious way back in the 60s to advertising, but it wasn't. And when it became, I just thought it was a kind of thing like grain, which would come in fad and go out of fashion next week. Unfortunately, it's taken 10 years and it's still there. And I just think it's, it's just, you're trying to get an idea across and all you want to do is show on how these people aren't really acting, but they are acting, but maybe they shouldn't be. And, and all those things that go with it just, I think, bother me. And when I did the Lee Jean spot, it was supposed to be a take on exactly that. There's a moral acting like it's cinema where they, but it's not really, of course he's acting, but is he really a dickhead? Not really, is he? The, and it kind of carried on like that. So I, I like to play in it, but that's about it. What school did you go to? Uh, I went first to City College uh, in Los Angeles under a different name. And then I went to Art Center College of Design, Pasadena, in Los Angeles. Hi. Inspiring filmmakers as far as developing a reel and trying to get out there. Oh, I wish they'd advise me. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying the same thing. I'm trying to do spots here in America, and it's not from the lack of getting scripts, but I don't know how to turn them around so they would look like me. Uh, advice? I, I really don't know. I, 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 I just stepped into it, and uh, well, I, what, what advice do I give? I don't know. <laughs> I think everybody's, I mean, everybody's carving their own way out, and I think I'm trying to carve my way out. 
uh, wondering what are your what are your influences aside from maybe you could also include film aside from my girlfriend aside from your girlfriend uh, influences like per se in make you know music print work other things that have influenced your work hmm. I think film uh, I th I, th I think I wasn't aware on what must have influenced me until I think I, t I took a crew of some friends of mine to shoot something in India. And when they were seeing the films in India, they were saying, you know, their works just like yours. And when I was out there, I used to look at that and I used to think, oh, these guys singing around trees and everything just bugs me. And I think everything that I've seen is it's kind of gone to the back of my head. And every time I get a script, you know, you're not just paying for the one month that I'll be working for you to use the old Picasso cliche, you know, you're paying for 33 years and, and one month. And it's exactly it. I think everything comes to life. You know, the 10 years I spent in school in the Himalayas, the, the, the two years I spent in City College and selling cars in Los Angeles. I don't know. I think all of it basically, you know, it comes out as, as that. But as far as if you're talking about aesthetic, hmm, I think I, I do love Tarkovsky, and I wish I would stop using his images so much. But I can't help it. I need to exorcise them. So I use how, how much ever I can music-wise. No, I think like in every category, music, film, whatever, 99% of it is crap, but I think in every category there's stuff that's brilliant. You know, I think rap is crap, but there's massive attack that's brilliant comes from rap. Most of metal, I think, is crap, but Metallica, I think, are brilliant. So I think that what you call you know, like brilliant or not is, of course, subjective. So I don't know if I could really put my finger on it and say you know, like who I like and who I don't. You'd have to come and hang out with me. <laughs> okay. To continue the debate on the spot, I, I think it's a beautiful spot, and actually I think to uh, remove the man with the bucket would be removing the humanity from it. And I suppose it's something that the most Western people don't understand, but um, I think it succeeds completely on both levels. One, the absolutely exquisite art direction of the primary red and yellow colors, the uh, alpha omega black and white, as well as uh, introducing this culture to uh, how other people eat and survive and live. Girl, I agree with you. Next one? Okay. I'll, uh, there's, there's two spots now that I'd like to show. Uh, the first one is a spot that I did in school. I used to live right... Uh PSA. And if they ran the PSA, could I have free passes for a year? And of course, uh, he said, first make the PSA. So this is a PSA for uh, uh, basically a public so that you would see in a revival hall. So that's why I don't have it on my reel because it doesn't really work. People don't understand what it's doing, then where it came from. It's from uh, basically, you know, it's, it's the place where you would see a Fellini film, but before the Fellini film, you'd see a preview of Attack of the 50 Foot Woman. So it's like that kind of a place and that kind of atmosphere. If you can imagine that, that would be the first part. That, that's the one that I did, the very first thing that I did in school. I filmed it myself, I printed each one of those things into photos, I colored it, I re-registered it, took about a year and a half, doesn't show, but basically I think my, my I, I think it, it's, it's a very strong idea, that's one. That's school, first thing I did in school, and the second thing is a commercial that I've just done for America, and again I think it'll lose a bit because right now I think they're going to lose my music, they're going to lose a lot of things that I think should be there and quite integral in it. I like the simplicity of the second spot a lot also. So I'll just show those two and then I'll talk a little bit more. Uh, the first part, like I said, was the school one. This one here, I think, is my little baby because I had a very hard time in it. We went down to Phuket to shoot it in Thailand and, and for the first time in my life I shot second unit. And because I didn't know how to swim, I had to figure out the people would tell me what the visibility in the water like was like, what the elephant was doing. And it was crap when we came back. The person told me that everything was fine. And, uh, the second unit cameraman. It didn't really work. And then I just said that I'm going to take a camera and I'm going to go whichever part of the world I can find elephants and go and film it, because which is, of course, India. I've seen them swim since I was a kid, but never from underwater. So I went down to the Andaman Islands, and it was the most fantastic place to go and learn how to swim among four elephants swimming around you. <laughs> it was just an incredible experience. I think just swimming pools just don't feel the same anymore. <laughs> it just. The, the coral, the everything. There's some, something that I learned about elephants out there was, uh, well, first of all, when they, they don't really swim on top, they swim underwater and they keep their trunk out here. And they use it like a snorkel. The problem being the amount of pressure that's around them, they crap every two seconds. <laughs> and, and, 
and every time we were filming and we were trying to get the shot from the back of the elephant going away and all the footage is full of these basketballs coming out of his <laughs> bum every time. And it's really, really sweet. And so uh, production did help a lot in that one though because they knew how to swim so they were responsible for pulling the shit out and they were all in it. And we had to take it out because it, it would just basically deteriorate immediately and the water visibility would go to shit. <laughs> and we tried that. So I think the idea was very simple and was very nice. It was, it was supposed to be a 30 second spot at the last minute. We were supposed to shoot two and the agency decided the second one was going to be canned and I asked them if this could become a 60 and they agreed. So I shot it and made it as a 60. Unfortunately, they're having music problems with it, which I think is very important because any sort of English words will make you concentrate on the wrong thing. It's just, the idea just is that most people around the world don't know that elephants swim. And that's all I wanted to show. When I said, they said, but in 30 it works, why do you want a 60? And I just said, all you'll have in the 60 is more elephant swimming. And I think that's exactly it. So it, it works like that. Any questions on that before I move on? Thank you. The, the only thing I'd say there is the, uh, the, the one that I like didn't run like that at all, the, the Vauxhall in the desert. Uh, one, I think about one week before we went down there to shoot, all my references for that had always been, you know, Reef and Stahl's period in, in, uh, with the Nubians. And I just wanted all very fascist, very, you know, like heroic images that this guy just belongs in this environment. And I think one week before we went in, they came back saying that the ITVA, which is the governing censorship body in England, had decided that if we did the same idea with an Aborigine, it would be fine. But if we did it with a black man, it doesn't work. It's very racist, blah, blah, blah. And I kept trying to explain to them that the Aborigine that you've got has a paunch and he's standing like that. And this guy's like this. What does what that did justify to me? Basically, it was just one of those reasons where you know, it, the whole thing was run by a bunch of people who couldn't believe that we were requesting them by showing them all these references that couldn't you just say that the same idea how can it be okay for one race and not for another but they didn't let it but that, that meeting was very good for me because for the first time I realized that what an account person's job really is because I saw her in the middle of all these people you know that just had no clue and she completely carried the meeting I, I thought account people were always for taking the client out and getting him laid and it was just <laughs> It was the first time I saw it, and I thought, oh my god, they really have a job. She was brilliant. She impressed the daylights out of me, and I had a great time. But unfortunately, what ran on the air was with an aborigine, and it was 40 seconds long, so I had to finish my cut, and there it is. Oh, okay, then I'll start one, one more on, on one piece, okay. Uh, I'd like to show this, if you go, one, one music video that I've done. Uh, the difference between the music video and the commercial world is, of course, fantastic. But I think one, uh, on, on a music video, I just don't take an idea or anything from anybody. I completely have to do it my way. And I, I don't charge any money. I do it on my own. And all the people who work for me do it for free. So with the result that if the band wants to say anything, I walk away. And this was a video that I did. And they don't have, well, of course, they didn't have any money. So I put in a lot of my money. And it takes me four to five months to shoot a music video. That's why, since the REM one, this is pretty much all I've done. And uh, again, the difference between music video and commercial, of course, in the commercial, your idea has to be so clear that if, when you see it, boom, you should get it. With music video, it's something that's regurgitated again and again and again, so you have to hide all that you're talking about. So people seeing it for the 20th time will, will, will think there's something new that they've seen. So just because I don't think you're going to see it 20 times, I'll, 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 I'll give you the, the structure on where I got it from and why you're seeing it the way it is. Uh, basically, the story came from... Uh, now, this will be doing it wrong. Why don't you see it first, and then we can talk for two seconds, and then we can see what's up. Well, that, that's the last video that I've done since the REM one. Very good question. Uh, I'll just tell you roughly where, where that came from, and then you can ask any question in general. Uh, it was actually originally the, when they sent me the, the music. It's a lullaby that somebody had recorded, I think, about 60 years ago. And uh, some, these guys found it from some uh, library and just actually decided to put music to it. And I thought it was interesting, but I asked to hear the girl's voice originally, and when they sent it to me, just without anything, I just fell in love with the voice, and I just thought, if they would let me run the whole video and run the girl's voice in the end, I would do it. And they said, fine. And then, basically, I never met the people who did the music or anything. Uh, the only thing that happened was, um, the idea came from, I think there's, there's a story about Ganesh, the Indian, uh, you know, the god with the elephant head. 
at, at the, the original base of the idea, which was, I think, he's sleeping with his, uh, he was really obsessed with his mom all the time, all his world, he was along with his mom, and his, uh, um, his bigger brother challenged him to a race around the globe, and basically went off on a chariot full of horses that could fly, and gave Ganesh basically a little chariot that was pulled by rats, and said, you know, let's have a race, and the bigger brother left, and then he came back three days later and he said, well, Ganesh, I won. And the little, I mean, like Ganesh's answer was not really because I went around my mom three times and she's my world to me. He said, it's one of those. And I thought, great story. What you got to do is have a guy go around the globe but not really leave where he's at. And I thought, how do we do that? My girlfriend said, tricycle. And I said, oh, great. So he said, okay, <laughs> we have a tricycle. We can have the person go around the, go uh, around the globe basically in a tricycle looking for what? And, we were, and the, the song is supposed to be lullaby, so she's looking for a lullaby. We thought, okay, we could start with something like that. And it was basically, we said, no, you could start a little girl in her sister's arms, and her sister's trying to put her to sleep, because the musicians told me that from what they could understand, it was supposed to be a song about somebody singing to a little girl, saying that, go to sleep, our parents aren't coming back, but go to sleep, or whatever. And I thought she could, she could have insomnia, this little girl, and she could you know, go around the globe thinking, trying to see how other people put babies to sleep. So she goes to Africa and she sees somebody singing a lullaby with the children on the feet. Then she goes to Moscow and somebody and like some kids play with their ears. So that's my little niece, of course, because we had no money. So I took my niece and my, my sister and she came up with all the ideas that the kids do when they try to sleep. She said, no, they play with the hair, they play with the ear. So she goes around the globe trying to see how people you know, like sleep. And then she remembers, she goes to India and she sees somebody's rocking a baby and she remembers, ah, that's what my sister was doing to me. She goes, ka-ching, and she's back at her sister's arms and she goes to sleep. So that was it. I was, that was what was intended. It doesn't come across as that, but it's not supposed to. It's just supposed to feel right. <laughs> on commercials, on something like Smirnoff or the Levi's and everything, I, like they say, like David says, I don't do coverage. People who paint paintings do coverage. I mean, not paintings, uh, houses. But I don't either. I'll shoot the same shot 90 times if you want, but I will not do coverage because I, I think I know how it's supposed to cut. And, but when it comes to a video, no. There's no storyboarding done before. There's about this many references that we write our notes on, and we go around and just basically see what we can shoot. But when it comes to a commercial, it is down to the second. If you took a shot out, you'd have to put a board up there that says scene missing, because there's, there's no space. So it, it is like that. They're very carefully structured. So you, you'll see that from some of the storyboards that I do have here. But uh, yes, it is, it is intensive, intensive pre-production. The shoot, like I always say, my, my AD could shoot everything that I do because on the shoot there's nothing to do but really be technical. Everything. Yeah, I think I always say I, I, I only cater to creatives who write the idea. I don't cater to the head of the agency or anybody. If they say that you're being a pain in the ass, now go away. I'll go away. And I'll cut my version when I need to. Hasn't happened so far, but I'm sure it will. But I, I leave it there, I think. Uh, but I'd really like to be involved, which is kind of shady here in America, which is the you know, directors are going from one spot to the other and don't really have the time to come in and cut their stuff. I mean, that's really bizarre. Unless you're shooting a storyboard that, you know, of course, the agency has drawn up. And which would, for the right reasons, give the agencies the scare about a director's going to walk off after this. We know this cuts to this, but he's shooting a shot that doesn't really fit. And they'll keep coming up to you and telling you to change it. I always say, this is the board that I'm talking about. This will cut when I shoot it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, I'd like to know um, if you could tell us a little bit about your heritage one. And also, you say uh, you work uh, not so much work for America. What other places do you work for at this point? Uh, what is the first question? Heritage? What, which one? You mean the, the A&E spa? No, no. A little bit about where you're from. Oh, where I'm from. Oh, OK. Well, some people say I'm from Kansas. I don't believe them. Uh, no. I, I grew up uh, in India. I was born in Punjab. and spent basically 12 years in a boarding school up in the Himalayas. And my father's been working in Iran for the last 35 years. So I used to stay there for nine months and spend three months when the school used to get snowed in in the winter in Iran. Shuttled between that, back and front. And then I decided to come to America. Wanted to study film. And uh, it was about 10 years ago. And since then, moved to Los Angeles. And after Los Angeles, when I came out with the work from school, I thought it was very strong. But then I did a couple of spots here, and it kind of shook me a bit. And I thought, well, either I got to go back to school and do a few more spots to tell people this is what I'd like to do, or I should find another arena. 
and then I kind of thought a European work was a little more, more creative. And after the video, you know, they were giving me a lot more leeway. They were saying, like, here's one line, can you make it work? And that's how I wanted to work. So I just thought if I did that, I could come back here and say, you know, could I work like this? Uh, the, the Coke spot that came in is, is the perfect example for me. When they sent it to me, you know, like, I went and worked with them on it, on the idea. And basically, it was just supposed to be an elephant swimming. And how do you put the product in? Yeah, the elephant comes and gives her peanuts and takes the Coke away. It's simple, and it works. I was just wondering if you plan to be doing longer format things for films or, I mean, you, you always say that you'd like to express yourself in a longer format. Would you be doing anything? You mean like a feature? Like a film, yeah. Uh, when I grow up, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just have too many weird images that I need to exercise before. I love what I'm doing. I think when I get bored with it and if I start doing the same thing again and again, come shoot me or, <laughs> or just ask me to move on. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you on a global level. Uh, so many times a lot of these corporations have this global reach, but they seem to reach for the pablum or the lowest common denominator. And I think your vision, your globalness is a, a very refreshing win. Thank you, sir. Thank you. If I can actually just steal a question that John Kamen has asked, what do you dream at night? <laughs> Depends on what I've been smoking. No, no. No, I, I, I don't drink or smoke. Bad, bad, bad thing. But uh, what do I dream? I don't know. I don't remember. Your imagery is so much richer and more complex than anything I've ever seen. I think probably most of the people in this room. Uh, is there any way you can account for that? Uh, I mean, well, I think just my background being is more different is all I can think of because I, th I think it's just where, where I take the images from is, is it more mythology? obscure. Mythology? Well, is it fairy tales? Is it mythology is part of it. Anybody who sees you know, where I get my references from always you know, like is saying that you should stop people ripping people off or blah, blah, whatever. But most people, I think, in America, they see it, can't really see that. And to all, you know, quote the old cliche, you know, originality is nothing but you know, concealing the art of your soul. Uh, Originality is nothing but considering the art of your source. Somewhere there. Exacto mundo. <laughs> so basically, I think my, my references come from Hindi movies. They come from watching TV at 3 o'clock at night where it says 976 P E E E, the extra E for the extra P. <laughs> that kind of stuff, I think, somehow goes in here and I'm sitting watching TV. That gets mixed with Tarkovsky and that's what comes out. Thank you.